Hello and welcome to this, the fourth and penultimate conversation in a series of five being hosted by me, Niall Maxwell, on behalf of Architecture at the Edge, the Architecture Festival of Galway, with this year's festival entitled Boundaries. The festival is on a mission to make architecture more accessible, to improve the perception of architecture and the profession, to promote sustainable development and to help shape the quality of the built environment. These conversations are aimed at understanding how to implement these ambitions in the form of a summer school to be running Galway in 2021. With news that the festival has received funding from the Arts Council of Ireland, these five conversations become all the more relevant and as we speak to experts from across Europe on how best to approach preparing the ground for such an event. In week one, we started out speaking with three practitioners working in interconnected disciplines. Tom Keeley from Keeley Travel, now based in Cork. Fee McDonald from Matt and Fiona based in London. And Owen Griffiths from Ways of Working based in Swansea, each giving their own particular take on approaches to engagement and participation their pleasures and pitfalls. In week two, we focused our conversation on participatory techniques with Daisy Frude from London, the experience facilitator and community engagement specialist, Dr. Mari McVicker from Cardiff University with her engagement work as lead of the Community Gateway Project in the Grangetown district of the city. And finally, Sebastio Lebotton from Collectivo Warehouse in Lisbon, showing us his sensitive and empathetic community projects from across the city. We learned that time was a critical factor, that legacy can be measured in different ways. And last week we entertained friend and collaborator of Sebastio, Alex Roma from Construct Lab in Berlin, an architect, designer and carpenter, discussing over whiskey, as it turned out, his laboratory for action research, constructive experimentation, and interdisciplinary creation. He was joined by the writer and curator, Jess Fernie, discussing dialogue, research, and engagement in art practice. And Lee Illett from Baxendale Studio, explaining his more visceral process of working with marginalized communities at the very early stage of long-term regeneration. We discussed how to give communities agency, how to empower them through design, and how design can act as a catalyst for community cohesion. So what have we learned from all of this? Well, perhaps it would be easy to drift through these conversations, enjoying the anecdotes and contributions from various experts without framing the conversation towards Galway and the intended aims and ambitions of the festival and the funders who are supporting next year's event. 80,000 people are currently resident within the city and it is anticipated that this number will grow by 50% by 2040. Until lockdown, 20,000 people commuted into the city every day from the broader Galway county population of quarter of a million. This is a rural condition, but one set within outstanding physical beauty. Tourism is big, and in normal times, the city grows to absorb the seasonal influx from domestic and foreign visitors. Hopefully next year, things will return to normal. But rural Galway is home also to global media, uh, medtech hub and a burgeoning creative economy. It is the home of the cultural festival. So a summer school will not feel out of place in this coastal community, but it is important that we understand how we engage, with whom, and what steps need to be put in place in the months that lie ahead. So in this penultimate week, we focus our attention on looking at examples of summer schools from across Europe, which demonstrate models of engagement participation and connection to place. Joining me this week in this episode that we've called Best Practice is Xenia Ajube, an experienced researcher and architect and the future 2021 Fulbright Visiting Scholar at the Pratt Institute, New York City. Congratulations, Xenia. She works on proposals for how rural technologies and collective craft practices can improve the quality of life in cities. Senya has run design studios in universities in Europe and Russia, and is the founder of the Nikola Lenovets Classroom, a research and education center based in the largest art park in Europe, part of the global free unit, decentralized network for education, working with the esteemed academic, Robert Mull. Nicolas Fenelsa is founder of the architecture practice Atelier Fenelsa based in Berlin and Gesfeld, 
After studies in West Germany and Tokyo, he began his career at De Wilde Winktelje in Ghent and TBBK in Berlin, whilst holding teaching positions across Germany. He's currently the emerging curator of the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal and recently exhibited at the Oslo Triennale. The atelier investigates contemporary forms of working, living and commoning in the countryside, the periphery and the city, realising private projects, public buildings, exhibitions and workshops. They run a summer school in, um, in Gisvald and this is what we hope to discuss shortly with Nicholas. And finally, um, to bring us back a little bit to Ireland, we're joined by Andrew Clancy, one half of Clancy Moore and Professor of Architecture at the Kingston School of Art in London, an established figure in the contemporary architectural scene of Ireland, and um, in fact was chairing one of the events for the festival back in October. But along with his prominent uh, academic work at Kingston, Andrew's work with Niall, uh, Neil Hobhouse in Drawing Matter at Chateau Farm in Somerset is his contribution tonight discussing the architectural drawing summer school for young people interested in exploring a career in the profession. Well, I just about got through that, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and welcome you all uh, to tonight. Um, hello, Xenia, where are you? Hello. Hello, where do we find you tonight? Um, I'm actually in Italy. Uh, on the Mediterranean coast um, and I went swimming today. It's the 3rd of December. <laughs> you're, just, you're just showing off. Thanks very much for that. Nicholas, <laughs> um, where do we find you tonight? Where has he gone? Are you there, Nicholas? He's disappeared. I can see his curtain. It looks like a photo booth for, for a passport place. Andrew, you, you're joining us from Dublin, I think. You're not in Kingston tonight, is that right? No, in Dublin, in our studio in Mead Street. Are you still, are you still in lockdown in Ireland? I can't remember what the situation is. No, we're not. Uh, well, it, 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 lockdown, as a relative term, the restrictions that they were in place lifted yesterday, but we were working throughout as essential workers because construction stayed open here. And how have you managed to deal with your teaching commitments remotely? Has it been re relatively straightforward? Um, yes, in one level, and then another level is no. I mean, because I, I do more than teach, obviously, we kind of, myself and Mary Vaughan Johnson sort of direct the department. Um, and I think what we've worked hardest on is trying to find a way for the, this kind of mode of communication is really good for procedural stuff, for one-to-one -one stuff, but it's terrible for all the peripheral stuff that actually makes an education and a context. So that's what's been so time consuming and exhausting and all of that is making a rounded education with multiple layers of engagement from the student. It's good fun, but we're looking forward to physical encounters soon. I, I think we're all looking forward to that. Nicholas, you're back. You disappeared for a minute. Um, yeah, sorry. That's uh, right. Are you, where, where are you tonight? I'm in uh, Berlin uh, currently, but yeah, just you were mentioning Gaswalde, the small village where our second office is, and I just came back um, experiencing the first snow uh, of this year on the construction site there. Uh, so today I worked there on site. A totally, a totally different experience from Xenia and, and, and obviously um, Andrew in his basement with no daylight whatsoever. So uh, a nice balance. Xenia, could we start with you tonight? You, you were going to share your screen to maybe provide us with a a bit of background to the work we have been doing over the years in Russia. Can I tell um, you? Yeah, shall I introduce myself? Please do, T take, the, take the floor. Um, myself and uh, tell you a little bit about uh, what we've been doing in Russia over the years. Um, I'm more or less from London and was born and grew up in mega cities um, and uh, again moved to another mega city, moved to Moscow in 2012 where I was involved in setting up an independent architecture school with Robert Mull and uh, completely by accident I ended up working in a massive art park in rural Russia uh, which is in the middle of nowhere at the end of a terrible road which acts as a natural barrier to entry and weeds out those who are not uh, dedicated enough to get there. 
And this art park um, ended up kind of being at the center of my life. I ended up moving there and moving to a tiny village. In fact, our village uh, only had two uh, houses that were inhabited all year round and about 10 summer houses and that was it. It was surrounded by another couple of villages with about 100, 200 inhabitants. Um, but in this place, uh, there was an artist who'd moved there at the end of the 90s called Nikolai Paliski. And he started making these um, land artworks. He's uh, hailed as the inventor of Russian land art. And this is one of his works that you see before you now, which is a, a 20 meter high uh, sculpture made in an abandoned field, uh, the whole territory. It used to be a collective farm, Kolhos, which was abandoned and closed down um, in the late 90s. And so consequently, a lot of people uh, lost their jobs, but not only lost their, their kind of meaningful relationship with the landscape. And Nikolai, um, his work is very interesting because he just, uh, he was a landscape painter before this, and he just started to engage the local community in things that they'd never done before, in building uh, using locally available uh, materials such as the willow that you saw on the previous slide, such as um, free materials readily available, hay and snow, using techniques that they might have even used in the collective farm. Um, but really, cementing the value of the community and the value of this place just by doing work with uh, the locals. And the, um, the artworks uh, became so well known that in fact uh, festivals and an art park um, accumulated and emerged out of his projects. So he then ended up uh, supporting financially all of the surrounding villages and living in, in the village, in Nikola Lenovet's village I've just talked about. And in the end, em employing now 300 people um, in, this, um, in this rural um, and peripheral uh, location, which is of great natural beauty, um, but really is nothing special and um, not a lot distinguishes it from uh, enormous expanses of kind of abandoned post-apocalyptic um, post-Soviet space, which is um, on the whole abandoned. So when, when I moved there, I realized that there was a lot of uh, knowledge and, um, and, and invention in the, in the workings of this artist and that he was effectively inventing new rural rituals which allowed uh, for for sustaining these societies and for building new economies of labor which were fueled by visitors which were fueled by international interest and so on and so we started um, a kind of research and education center to accumulate this knowledge and to share it with uh, young people and with other experts and this is um, a pavilion which we built together with Tom Randall Page and Robert Mull in the first summer that we ran um, a live uh, classroom, a, a building classroom. And uh, you can see that it's it's looking out onto Babor, the sculpture which was on the first slide. Um, and we decided to build effectively a summer classroom with our own hands to um, to inhabit and to use, to invite young people, about groups of 20 people at a time, to tell them the story of this park and the story of this kind of um, miracle um, and to give them a lived experience and a very close uh, experience of life in this village and life in this park. Uh, behind the scenes to a large extent, uh, which turned out to be a very fruitful and enriching um, experience for, for a lot of them because they, because we were engaging in big ideas such as, you know, the sharing of tools, the creating footholds for local people and local economies. 
um, with the idea of education going outside and hands-on education, with the idea of um, the kind of interdependence, the kind of global inter interdependence of bodies of water, of ecologies and so on. And all these things could be, um, could be kind of, one could gain the inspiration and also a very direct uh, personal and physical experience of these things in this tiny village in Russia. And um, um, as I mentioned before, um, this was really initiated with the support of Robert Mull and also uh, Tom Randall Page played a very important part in this. And um, I think that gave me the sort of, uh, I was living in the village and, you know, organizing everything, organizing people's lunches and whatever, <laughs> and also thinking about these big ideas. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think at the beginning we thought we were kind of marginal and um, a bit nuts. And we had these themes which were called art as labor, and what would happen in a post work future when uh, craft and making could be central to understanding the human condition. You know? And then, and then um, Ram Kulhas uh, did this exhibition in the Guggenheim, which happened in, in New York last year, called Countryside the Future. And you know, and you suddenly realize that actually maybe these ideas you were thinking about weren't so crazy. And um, as you mentioned, um, I've recently been invited to New York to work on the Climate Museum project uh, on Governor's Island in between Manhattan and Brooklyn, where uh, these are precisely the ideas that they're interested in finding more about how to engage communities how to educate young people through making and lived experience of growing of um you know thinking in in kind of um strange ecosystem conditions of what we can learn from sustainable and local building techniques of um yeah, what we can learn just from working with each other, with people who are very different to us, and also about um, collectively created artworks which are conscious, which are uh, accountable to the environment, and um, yeah, which create these new, new kind of approaches, I suppose, to life. Um, and that's how I believe that uh, cities can learn from villages, cities can learn from um, rural um, contexts, but also that it's important for um, the new rural condition to be a kind of driver for change and an inventor of uh, these new ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Zane. That's really, really fascinating. So just to, just to get this clear, you moved to Russia in 2012, but actually this as a summer school starts operating in 2015, is that right? right? Uh, yes, I, um, I think I started working in the park in 2013 as an architect and really just as a, but mainly just um, as a, um, um, as a, as a, in training in the studio of this incredible artist, Nikolai Paliski, um, just learning uh, from him. Um, how with incredible ease, almost no money, and just the goodwill of <laughs> everyone who surrounded him, how he made these uh, artworks which were 20 meters high and 20 meters across using materials that had come literally from the bank of the river. So that was an incredible education for any architect, I think. And is, do you think the success is down to that one individual having that kind of level of charisma and drive and um, foresight? Or was there something particular about the community, the demographics or the level of unemployment or social inequality that drove this uh, development? How, how, could you sum that up maybe for us just to, to get a better sense of the context of the place? Yeah, I mean, I think the context was absolutely unique and ideal for, for this um, happy coincidence to emerge. I mean, just to give you an idea, it's the, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, artists in Moscow, 
um, lead quite uh, precarious existences. And so he and a group of his friends, an architect, a graphic designer, a musician, uh, go to live in this incredible, incredibly beautiful place with hardly any um, local people in, in the actual village where they live, but surrounded by kind of communities of people who are um, slowly losing their jobs because these collective farms, they di dissipate slowly over, over the course of 10 years in the case of Owl. And so suddenly this land uh, doesn't appear to belong to anyone and these people don't appear to belong to anything. And so, yes, of course, it was, and it, it was just, it just happened at this uh, unique moment in time when Nikolai thought, why don't I just go ahead and do something with this? I've got this landscape, I've got this uh, free material, and I've got this labor, which um, isn't going anywhere anyway. And it was enough to stir up a little bit of money through the, um, Moscow art scene to you know generate enough wages because of the kind of prices uh, difference at that time and it just um, and and people just worked very hard and had a lot of faith and the local um, wives of the workers founded cafes for the tourists that started coming in and it was incremental and then um, at one point it became undeniable and that's when the local community begin to truly own um, a project because they will argue strongly, you know, for or against decisions which stem from the, uh, the art park incentive, but they internalize them and think that it's actually their village that owns the art park, which is true. <laughs> There's two sort of themes there, aren't there? One is that it goes from the unplanned and sort of serendipitous opportunity to something that tips the other way and becomes organised and structured. But also from an ownership perspective, there's a kind of loss, isn't there, through the, the, the collective farm and this kind of loss of identity, which is then reclaimed through the process of the art park. Do you think that would be a, a fair summary? Yes, absolutely. And that was... Um... A, a kind of a decision and a deciding factor, I think, because um, Nikolai, the artist, and also his support network of the uh, curators, the artists, he invited the architects who were involved, um, they really invented a new ideology for rural life in Russia, which to a large extent, the traditional rural life largely it's deconstructed by the Soviet Union. Yes, a different reality is constructed in its place, but then with perestroika, you need to rethink that in a completely new and culturally interrelated context. And suddenly these people are making artworks which people, which are published in, in Tash and which is sold in London, you know, they, and they understand that. And that's a very powerful, um, culturally locating and geolocating um, mechanism which gives value yeah that they experience also yeah and, and our students experience the, the power of this so that's yeah. very we'll, we'll, we'll come on we'll come on to the students later i think because i'll be interested to understand actually who 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 is at the park who comes to these courses but also how it's changed over the years but i think Nick, nicholas can i bring you in here because it would be useful to sort of have have your take on something that I'm assuming your summer school is very planned and it's been quite organized since day one in terms of the way you think about what you're trying to achieve um is it the antidote do you think to the art the art park um I mean in, um so also thanks from me for the invitation and Welcome to everybody. But yes, uh, I think it's more um, prepared in the sense that for this one I'm showing tonight, this one workshop, it was very intense and very, uh, yeah, uh, just a few days, let's say. And also different topics, different people involved. So in the way we had to focus on... Uh, on uh, each day and um, yes and this was a small uh, workshop series um, I organized with the Canadian Center for Architecture 
as a emerging curator. And the intention is that this workshop series uh, already happened in Germany uh, this year and next year it uh, should happen uh, another part of uh, addition of it uh, in Canada. So in this sense, um, yeah, I think it's a very nice like step. We are now moving from Russia to to uh, to Germany and then to Canada. So and and basically the condition of the rule stays the same. And for us, we described it through our title called uh, "Pattern Patterns of Rural Commoning," because for us, yeah, this notion of, of patterns was very important. That these are things you can maybe observe in in Russia. You can observe them in, in Germany, and probably most likely something similar also happens in Canada. And um, also, or an, that already something ha yeah, happened in the past similar to this. So there's the pattern also can travel through time, let's say. Yeah, and for this small three-day workshop uh, series, we, we had one topic each day and um, one, um, one expert uh, kind of supporting us and guiding us through the day. And for the first day, the theme was craft. And we had this uh, master carpenter from the village where the workshop took place uh, here on the left. And with him, we kind of designed the small wooden pavilion uh, and we con constructed it within one day and only using kind of um, traditional joinery techniques. And um, yes, the, the next day, um, the theme was um, food. Like, and this is of course connected to garden. And we used uh, the method of fermentation. So we had an expert who is, uh, yeah, has a lot of knowledge concerning fermentation. And for us, it was a method of, let's say archiving a way of archiving uh, a certain uh, sensory experience or uh, also certain flavors, let's say, of this particular village. And for us, it was also important that this was a um, also a kind of pretext in involving and in the, the the villages, the village and the villagers. So here we we visited one. One lady, she has a huge garden and um, of 1,500 square meter. She's taken care by herself. And of course, also her contribution was to, um, yeah, to explain us her uh, way of gardening and yeah, explain us on, on this kind of, uh, what she's been growing there and all this kind of context. So in the way for us, the workshop, it like the, that there was no, let's say, direct relation to, to architecture, but of course the workshop itself took place in a specific village, in a specific space. And through the workshop, we could uh, experience these spaces and also experience the, the people who live there and who use it and the pattern, let's say of these places and um yeah the third day um we you can see already the the pavilion is um, is is up is con uh, constructed and the third day uh, it was the theme was a material and we um, had one expert uh, she is interested in plants and um, natural dyeing. And together with her, we kind of collected different um, herbs and plants and, for example, uh, dyed these uh, fabrics. Yes, and this kind of led to the uh, to also the event, concluding event at the last day 
where of course this was a, a reason to invite all the people we we met through the through, in the village through the last three days but also it was a possibility of bringing everything together so here the circles you see the themes material food craft and in the center is this kind of conclude, concluding event mm, and of and each day has certain locations and certain knowledge yes and here you see the kind of fermented products mm. and of course it's important that there is also let's say a discussion or a conversation at the last day on on this shared experience mm. and uh, for us it was also important that the and often in workshops you kind of produce items or objects you take home with you maybe but for us it was important that everything which is being produced is kind of given into this shared concluding event or let's say for the pavilion that is in a kind of semi-public space and can be used afterwards yes so this was Kind of intention of this could you, small, could you uh, explain workshop. could you explain for us Nicholas uh, the, the the context of Gesvant and uh, just for people who aren't familiar with it in terms of where it where okay. it is in Germany and, yes. and how it relates to its geography to where you are in Berlin yes so it's north 100 kilometers north of Berlin so it's a very sparsely populated area so but it has some few villages and uh, in the recent years, it's become it became quite popular amongst artists and creatives to move there. So I would say similar to the Russian condition, there were also like uh, groups of people moving there uh, and to this village especially. And this was also one reason for us that we opened a kind of satellite office there in that village and uh, yes so was it important do you think to be embedded in the community to before you could start to run the summer school yes it was very important i mean yeah maybe from just by looking at these pictures it could yeah maybe you could get the feeling that it's something you can organize easily or it's yeah but uh, let's say everything was um yeah communicated or there was a long preparation let's say so for example meeting this woman with the garden or meeting people who give uh, opened their houses that we can that the participants could stay there so let's say but this kind of relationship relationships that we built ahead uh, or like uh, before this workshops it was already starting without having the workshop in mind let's say and um, but this of course was very important to locate it in in that place so and embedded there so we so, think somewhere else it would be much more difficult okay but you're you're, you're basically building trust aren't you with with the community who i'm sure is, is, is are you finding that the the village is becoming gentrified or is it um is it still does it still have a balance of, of, of rural practice in terms of the community and the types of jobs and makeup of people? Yeah, I mean, this is a big discussion because um, uh, there is a kind of fear that um, through this attraction by the cultural activity, let's say, people want to move there and want maybe because it's still in a close proximity, use it as a holiday house. But um, yeah, for us, we try to encourage businesses, let's say like small local businesses. So for example, today uh, I met some people who are growing like um, edible mushrooms for, for restaurants and so, and I organized that they can rent a, a barn, a part of the barn we are renovating currently. So I think this is, interesting that through our presence there we can also direct the way or, or 
yeah, it's going. Yeah. So it's basically on us if we do a project to encourage if it becomes like, let's say, a holiday place or if it becomes a place for, uh, for work and production. So almost like you're acting as an ag agent for change, a facilitator. Zenia, can I, can I just bring you back in here? Because you, um, you, you're obviously there to organize the, the, the art park. How, did, how, did, um, how long did it take you to really build trust with the community that existed um, from the collective farm days? Yeah, I mean, Nicholas uh, rightly says that in our case, in my, personally, in my case, it took years <laughs> because it's a close-knit community, um, you know, it's a real village. It's not easy to just waltz in there with a funny accent, in my case, <laughs> you know. So, um, but it's worth it because what you get in return um, is priceless. Um, Uncle Victor will arrive at any moment with the chainsaw that we need. Um, Sasha will help us book the uh, crane, which I'll inevitably get the wrong crane and then he'll just magically fix everything. And we we're set to open that evening we've got guests coming and i need two more drills and i just call someone up and and uh, uh and he just drives he's just like what do you need and he's just there in five minutes and he just hands over tools i mean this is like a big deal in in that kind of context that someone would just give you their tools and trust you <laughs> when they know that you're giving them to like young people to use but you know this trust is so constructive between people it's so creative and also they respect us because they see that we are doing what they're doing and and we feel like we're inspired by them and are trying to copy them as as closely as uh, we can and they're flattered by that and they learn from us and we try and imbue, so Nikolai likes it, that I'm very um, uh, pedantic about health and safety. And he says, do it, do it, do that helmet and boots thing that you always do with your students. Maybe it'll rub off on my guys. <laughs> it goes both ways. So, Nicholas, can I, can I just um, maybe change tack a little bit, but I'm, I'm interested to know who, you, who, who are coming to your workshops. Is it, is it the architectural community or are you broadening your uh, reach through this program? Yeah, I mean, um, yes, um, through, let's say, the kind of framing, uh, of course, we want to encourage, let's say, um, all kind of discipline coming there. So I think this is also important that we, we have a workshop on, let's say, on food material, uh, textile so it's um, themes which are, um, are also open or interesting for other people and um, yes but but of course uh, most of the people that are participants that we have I mean we in, in our workshops we aim more for for let's say let's say professionals so not so much for students but, but it's more like a adult education, let's say, or like a kind of secondary education for, uh, yes. And, and most, most of the times the people, they already have a certain interest in the countryside or the rural condition. So they are, either they also have, a, they work there or they already live there or they think about this. So this is, quite good but of course for for it's very difficult to encourage let's say locals to participate there because for them it's not really so useful useful or practical to to join there and but at the same time you're you're obviously as you say using people from the local community to assist you with their expertise and um, yes Daniel, your students are coming from where to, to, to take part in this course? 
Uh, well, we have quite a lot of international students and we also partner with universities internationally uh, with UK universities, Swedish universities. But then students come, well, participants we call them, they come, or researchers depending, uh, from independently of their own accord from Japan, from Italy, from um, all all over Europe, from Russia, of course. So we usually have about 50% Russian participants and 50% international. And is there, is there some form of incentivizing to encourage that mix in terms of, do you, do you, do you offer uh, discounts or sort of some mechanism by which Russian students can get access to the course? Um, sometimes, yeah, sometimes the, uh, it, it really uh, depends the partnerships with the universities bring incentives because often um, universities will have it as a scholarship or as a prize for their best students to basically pay for them to join us. Um, and the people who are com come completely independently uh, often uh, practitioners and have you know, their own businesses or just an interest. Okay. Andrew, I'm, I don't know whether you, you're still with us or whether you've got fed up waiting. You're there, good. I thought we'd better, better bring you in. You've been very patient, sorry about that. But I, I was trying to lead this really towards the fact that you're doing something very different from the other two. Here, here's Nicholas dealing with almost sort of professionals and adults wanting to sort of learn other skills. Then you're in the middle ground of, of sort of the pedagogy. And, and you, you're actually looking at um, young people who are interested in the discipline of architecture and design. Could you maybe just expand on that for us? Yeah, um, our one, I mean, like I, I really value the summer schools that have been described and our one, <clears throat> we never really set out for it to be a summer school. Um, when I got, so I had left Queen's University Belfast, which had a very interesting mix of quite students from quite marginal backgrounds who asked quite profound questions about architecture. And I'd had a brief stint as visiting professor in Aarhus before I got the job in Kingston. And Kingston has this incredibly uh, well, diverse and kind of very open uh, student body who are engaged in architecture with a view to, to making a livelihood out of it. So it's, 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 it's sort of different to some of the standard tropes that the profession deals with, where people are kind of have a little bit of their own money and that kind of stuff in Kingston. They're quite different and they really ask very profound questions about architecture as a result and about the skills that they're being taught and why and how they can be of use. And this, the, the summer school as became came out of conversations with the students in first year and second year, my first year, and some of their frustrations about uh, architectural education about the sales pitches that they'd seen on open days from diverse schools and their inability to choose schools at those points and then the debt context of the UK um, and I know that exists in other countries where you're paying quite a large amount of money um, and so the conversation came with what if there was something for a 14 to 15 year old to do that was like a simulacrum of architectural studio culture that they could engage with for free um, and how what would that look like as a way for them independent of open days to begin to understand what is it about what it is that architectural education is like that might be attractive to them and this started between myself and Neil Hobhouse um, initially and then spread to include others from the Royal Fine Art Commission Trust, uh, Hauser and Wirth and others and we brought these people in as partners to help fund it and the context became an open call that would go to all UK schools, all secondary schools and just asking teachers to ask their classes if anybody was interested in studying architecture and that they would send a 50 word description of their favorite space to me in Kingston and from that we would make a selection of students um, and we would take them for a five-day residential uh, course in workshop I guess in Somerset near where Neil was and this was all kind of out of expediency he had a lot of contacts in those areas he knew he could leverage them and we were testing the idea and so um, we set up partnerships with local schools who could board the students for us and uh, other places where we could do workshops and we took the students together and we were conscious of a couple of layers to the summer school um, as, as it emerged. One is that a school is a culture um, and a culture is grounded in conversation 
and that the conversation we would have in this place would be about an intense way of seeing the built environment and the kind of built culture and a way for the students then to talk to one another. So not necessarily about output and not necessarily about skill, but about a place for people to engage. And then there's a second layer to it, which is that um, in most schools of architecture, the way they get tutors to start work is they just go, well, you're interesting, come in and do a crit. And then if they're interesting in the crit, they get thrown in to do teaching work, which seems to me um, really strange, actually, and, and actually a massive problem. Because if you're going to enable a diverse range of tutors or allow them to find their agency, then there needs to be other ways into the discipline. So another layer became added very quickly, which is that we'd also have an open call for tutors and that the tutors then would also engage in this residential context and that they would be people who hadn't taught before. Um, and that in that context, then we would open contacts for them and conversations between them, the organizers and the students, which might renew, say, my acquaintance with the urgency of architectural education, but also the nature of the summer school itself. So I'm not gonna do it at any great length, but I'm just gonna show you a little bit about the summer school. Um, it takes place in quite a strange part of the world as it's becoming in Somerset, which is, uh, I mean, it looks like an ordinary part of kind of the pastoral landscape of, of England, but the town in the north here is Bruton, which is, you know, quite a rarefied cultural condition on one level in terms of Hauser and Birth being there, but also, you know, some quite, some quite uh, deprived areas. To the left, we've got Castle Kerry, and in the middle is Neil Hobhouse's uh, farm and its archive, which you probably know about, the Drawing Matter uh, Trust. And the students are all housed in Bruton. In the first year, we had 14, then it grew to 28, and then to 42. And then this year, we dropped back down just for COVID, for isolation. And it's also that scaling is based on our capacity to raise money to support the students during it. Um, and basically, the exercises oscillate about drawing and spending time in space and spending space, time apart and together. And the drawing side of it is sort of an alibi to the things that it might produce. So the very first exercise they do is that they go to spots in the town so that they can only see one student in both direction and they're asked to make a drawing of the space between them and the student. And the consequence, of course, is a map which, um, I'll just drop that volume, a map which is highly varied in scale and based on their position in space, but also which takes time to do. And what happens is the students lean against windowsills and lean into doorways. And at the end, the critique, if you want to call it that, isn't of the drawings, it's of where they sat to make the drawing. And the observation that the built environment is an enabling armature, it isn't just a commodified place, that it has to offer graciousness in other ways. And so this is sort of the trick of the summer school, which is that the exercises are not about what they seem to be, they're about opening up conversations for other ways of understanding architecture, which we sort of feel is essential in the sense that enabling students to come into a school of architecture and look, there's a, such a wide variety of types of school of architecture and there's some great teachers and some less good teachers. And the interesting things that I saw in schools everywhere in first year, some of the exercises that people do being so perverse and so strange, we thought it would be interesting for students to arrive in with some of their own attitudes that they might have formed themselves. And the kind of context would be is that these students would go back to their schools, talk about this experience, maybe decide architecture isn't for them, but talk about it in a way that they might understand the intensity of studio endeavor, but also just how generous and open, and open this context is. And then they come here, which is Shatwell Farm, which is where Neil is, which looks like a very ordinary farm, but you know, the building on the left is the Hugh Strange designed archive building, which has probably the world's most significant collection of architectural drawings in privately held hands. The building on the right behind the trees is Stephen Taylor's cow barn, etc. So it's, this, it's Neil's place and it is a playground for architects and scholars of architecture. But for this week, it's full of you know, 15 year olds from East London and other places. And uh, what we do is we start to ask them to start to become fascinated by things in the yard and to identify things that might need repair. And out of that, then we bring them into the archive and we begin to find drawings which are in sympathy with the way they look. And there's this sort of empowering thing where students are picking up sketchbooks and you just whisper in their ear afterwards and say, you know, that's uh, Corbusier's sketchbook. And what's amazing about it, and they don't know who Kabusi is, and you go, well, you know, he's a famous architect who kind of changed the discipline for better or for worse. And the context of that is that what's in the sketchbook is so dreadfully uh, insecure and crude and human. And there's something about 
letting the students see the humanity of the endeavor right from the start. So right from the very start, they're holding drawings by architects that might be considered significant and seeing the tentativity of it, the fragility of it, and that that becomes part of the context. And then for the last day of it, there's days in between where they have barbecues and movie nights. It's not all drawing. We set up a drawing office for the last day in Shatwell where they're broken into groups and they're given a drawing table, which is like this. And then they're given material, which is what well, this year was scaffolding mesh, which is just a very cheap material. And they spend the first half of the day learning the language of the material. And we use these terms and we use the terms like tectonics or what does it want to become? And then they go back to the drawing office and they design uh, pavilions, which they have to hold up with their bodies. Um, and they make these kind of spaces. And the trick is that they have to be able to put them up in five minutes and take them down again. And the, the agenda here, here is to think about structure, structure is figuration, I suppose, about material and closure. And that might be ostensibly the, the course, but it's not really about that at all. The conversation then at the end is about how the architects who made the structure, because they're holding it up, can't experience it ever. And so the, the conversation that closes the summer school is always a conversation about how architecture is for others, that you make something with care, but you are sort of in the walls and it's your colleagues or your clients who walk through it in the end. And so the context then is about people being literally bound together into a structure of some kind. And I think that's what's clear, what we find kind of interesting about it is there's been about 110 students through it. There's been 16 amazing tutors through it. Like some of them you probably know very well at this stage, like Nana Biamu Fasu and Bushra Muhammad were our first two tutors in it who were amazing people um, in the architectural landscape at the moment, but so many others who've been through it. And what I love about it is this kind of um, thing where at the end of it every year, the tutors come together with the students and with Neil and myself and uh, Debbie and Isabel, the other people who help us organize it. And they sort of rewrite the manifesto for the following year. And the big ones always are, it's never means tested. So like, how do we make sure that it's diverse and fair? And we vote every year about whether it remains free for everybody. And that's really the challenge, which is that we find that the I mean, I always find it such a strange word that the UK private schools are called public schools, but the public school network in the UK is voracious in its capacity to sort of give platforms to its students. And it's not that we deny that, but we have to work really hard about finding spaces in schools that don't have those resources to get the message heard by students and for them to believe that they can come in. And so the alumni of the summer school are a key part of that percolation. And schools like Kingston, we partner with Queen's uh, with uh, Newcastle, Cardiff and uh, Glasgow and they're part of this kind of reaching out to maybe slightly forgotten parts of the secondary school network and encouraging them to engage. So that's, that's the, the context. Um, it is different and the outputs aren't as um, dramatic as, as architectural as the other two summer schools and the connection to place is one to do with the ability for us to resource this thing, Neil's collection being one and the towns being others. So the place as we see it is the community of people gathered together for that time. So it's a temporal event. So different to the other two summer schools in that way too. Thanks, Andrew. That's really, really interesting. I think context maybe for other people's benefit is really helpful though, isn't it? Because Bruton as a, as a small town has three public schools in it. Isn't that right? Yeah. So, um, Bruton is funded by this kind of public, well, private school, elite private school, educational landscape. And that's why Hauser and Wirth set up there, because I think the kids, of the partners that run that gallery went there. And there's this amazing moment. I mean, I've never been inside a private boarding school in my life. But the first one was when we went to the Bruton School for Girls with the students the first year. And, you know, you've got students coming in from Barking or wherever, and they're standing there and they're going, well, it's a bit... You know, it's a bit scruffy, isn't it? I mean, and there's sort of like that part of it, which is, you know, I came into architecture from a background where we didn't have a lot of money growing up. And I did find the enabling infrastructure of engaging with people who did really powerful in terms of opening context. And that's also part of the subtext of the summer school. And we make that explicit to the students that that is also what university is about. It's about you building your social understanding of the world and your ability to move in it. So yeah, Bruton is a funny place. And I think the people who live in Bruton would say it too. You know, it's Porsche SUVs and lattes and tractors and people surviving on 12,000 pounds a year as well. Yeah, and that's, and that's the most interesting part of that demographic, I suppose. I love the phrase humanity of endeavor, really. The, the, this, this idea of 
of understanding that you're giving to these young people. Do you, do, you, do you track how many end up going into the architecture profession or into study, sorry? We don't track it, but most of them stay in contact with their tutors and with me and directly. I, we, it's about two thirds go into architecture, uh, about two thirds. And it, it, sometimes the people who don't go in that are really interesting and they kind of, they will continue conversations about the built environment afterwards by email and sometimes they just send you emails because they're so chuffed. There was a student from our first years and she just got a scholarship uh, to Mendricio and it was one of those things where she just sent an email going, I can't believe it. And we're no way responsible for that. She's an amazing person. But they do kind of stay in touch. But it was their first step inside the door of architecture, maybe. And, and you're sowing the seed, I suppose. That's really the, the, the starting point for it, isn't it? And um, just, I want to pick up on the, on, the, on the idea of this rewriting of the manifesto, because a number of the themes that have come out of these conversations are, I think Fee McDonald described it best, that none of these processes are linear. You start off with an idea and actually you don't even sometimes start. You come in part way, part way through the process. Could you, could you maybe just succinctly describe how it's changed over the years and what has been the, the main factors to, to cause that change? Um, yeah, it's changed in a number of ways. Um, the ratio of students to tutors has changed to slightly more students to tutors than we started with. We started with five to one and it's become seven to one and that just seems to work better for all kinds of reasons. The students get more agency actually, or they, they have the agency, but they feel more space to express it. There's less time for the tutors. And then we also now have added a more somebody more mature who comes and isn't linked to any specific group of tutors who but just sort of lingers around and it's sort of there to talk to people on the downtime and become a different type of contact. So last year was Michael Badu and they, they are a key part of it. And then the other side of it is the understanding of the exercises which are run. So, you know, the, the year just gone, I couldn't be there. And so it was Eleanor Bowman, Oscar Mathers and Marwa Mubarak who did it. And they completely changed the course and built physical pavilions. And the only reason I didn't show them is because I don't have photographs because I wasn't actually physically there. So yes, it changes every year um, and will change again. Zenia, could I bring you back in here? Thank you, Andrew, by the way, it's re really fascinating. Zenia, in terms of how you plan what you do with the students or the participants every year, how do you structure that? Yeah, um, I mean, firstly, Andrew, I'm so inspired by your project and I just think it's so beautiful on so many levels. Um, and I think one has to be quite careful about orchestrating these things and we certainly plan them a little bit like you do by the sounds of things um curate them uh, there are uh there are speeds at which you you go there are moments of um warm up and ice breaking and and team building that happen at strategic points and you gain this understanding through practice and through uh, experience in working with young people and in the end I mean we try and curate like a uh, holistic experience in starting from the like hacking list that they get um, <laughs> and, the, and the way we meet them and greet them and the, the words that we use and the level of formality or informality and the view that we choose for the first evening when we all drink together on a roof or a um, whatever it may be. And it's not about kind of selling anything or, or creating memorable experiences. It's really about, um, I mean, I could say blowing people's minds, but um, <laughs> try and put it more politely, but basically, uh, yeah, like changing um, people's young people's perceptions because um, going back to what Andrew was talking about, because uh, suddenly they understand how uh, one, how an artist might uh, see and seize an opportunity. Suddenly they they understand that they could approach and ask for advice and help somebody who they definitely think they had 
thought they had no access to previously because we would and actually I think the theme of mentorship is perhaps one of the most important um, uh, I think aspects of this and also something we should move towards in, in education um, because um, and also this that it it shouldn't just be uh, the mentorship that students of architectural young people in general gain shouldn't just be from esteemed uh, academics or practitioners it should be from all sorts of different people like glass blowers or mechanics or uh, winter swimmers <laughs> you know gr growers of gardens because that's what's going to make them resilient and that's what's going to future proof them it's a kind of balance, isn't it, between life skills and, 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 and learning. You're sort of trying to find a, tread that sort of fine balance. Nicholas, bring you back in here. How, Andrew describes quite clearly as the Xenia, sort of the people that surround them when they're sort of delivering this, this programme. How, how, how have you thought about that and how have you framed it? I'm thinking particularly of the idea that you're moving from Germany to Canada to deliver a similar programme next year. And what's your thinking about how that's going to work? Um, yes, I mean, of course, uh, this will in Canada will need to have some some research in advance to find this location who already has, let's say, the the setting, the context, uh, and the people. Yeah. So what Xenia is describing, yeah, this kind of experts of the everyday, or like um, this kind of, uh, yeah, the people who it's good to in. in involve them in the project because i i feel yeah that uh, our current way of educating and also for me this is uh, very rooted in the urban city that it's about specialized specializing and specialization of one specific thing and um, on the other hand it's this kind of more broad uh, knowledge of of many things uh, which is, I would say, a potential of the rural context. Uh, and yes, and for in preparation to the, to the workshops, um, for example, one in Canada, of course, it's all about finding, um, finding these people and, uh, and involve them in the, in the, uh, contact in, in the workshop itself and sometimes it can also be only a person who is kind of cooking and then um, like um, guiding people different types of recipes and I mean so for us yeah as Senya was describing this holistic experience I think is very important that it's not only about this kind of professional skills but Basically, it starts the moment you arrive, and uh, it's in the evening. And yeah, bas basically, the the this kind of learning is not stopping. And I think this is something um, I I learned when I was uh, studying in Japan uh, with uh, Yoshiharu Tsukamoto, where he, as an architecture professor, would also teach us different kind of um, uh, recipes and cooking and I don't know it it was like or when we had like personal problems we could ask him for advice so it was a total different uh, relationship let's say that's really interesting I didn't, I didn't realize you had that connection it's that's fascinating because probably I can't imagine that you you can't you leave you're left with such a, a strong legacy that way in your own thinking as to how you then approach your own professional work. Andrew, if, um, if, if I could maybe just start, move the subject on, because I'm realizing that we're sort of already over time. Um, in, ter in terms of the, the summer school, when you set, set out to, to do this, obviously you said it wasn't going to be a summer school originally, but do, you, do you now look at a, some form of legacy or some long-term structure that is going to be put in place? It's obviously relying heavily on Neil and his sort of farm. I think if we're honest, we started out thinking it was going to be about that. And 
Now we think it's about people and that it will have a, a duration and that it's more of a, an idea that will be emulated and emulated differently by others. Because the one thing I think that we've learned is that, oh, you can have all the plans you want, but you have to be very nimble. And it's astutely reactive to the morale of the groups of people, their specific atmospheres, the weather, and the need to kind of thread all that together. And so there's so much of it that isn't sort of systematizable. I mean, I think if, I, if we were honest, Neil did hope initially that we would produce something that we would have multiples of these across the UK, but others will do them differently. And I think that's as it should be. And so no, that would be a big thing that's probably changed is at some point Neil and I and others, or maybe others will do it in the same place, we don't know, but it would be different then and it would probably be the same thing and that's okay. Yeah, and I think that's also a natural progress of life, isn't it? So it's, it's, yeah. it's the water under the bridge. Um, Zenia, you, you're, you're in a similar predicament though, I suppose, because at some point Nikolai will not be doing this. He won't be the great charismatic leader. What will happen? Well, we can still carry on without Nikolai. We're okay. all invited. But is, it, but is, that, <laughs> is, is that because the, the agency is now with the village and with the people who are there you know, 365 days of the year? Um, the project is bigger than its initiator, I think, definitely. Okay, because um, you've, because yeah. you've, you've gone past that tipping point now. For the uh, art park in general. But um, yeah, also equally, it's not localized. It's, um, and it can, happen in all sorts of different places. For example, uh, we might run a summer school in Lake, on Lake Baikal, um, exploring the ecological detriment there and also coming up with you know, strategies to do tourism and cultural tourism in a similar way. Um, but um, yeah, I just, uh, I just think that um, it's, it's a free, it's like an open source. It should be an open source technology. Like anyone can go and do it. Um, architecture at the edge should go and do it. And so should lots of other people. Yes, there's good practice. Um, and yes, everyone should do it well. <laughs> but, um, I mean, really it, it's such a complex question, but I, I just think that actually the boundaries between school education and higher education are blurring and it's and so these um, projects which are trans age and experience and also they involve lots of disciplines are n natural it's simply a natural progression they're going to happen more and more. Nicholas do you see this as being an in integral part of your practice for the rest of your career or is this something that's just become will it decouple do you think would it become a totally separate entity from the not the work that you do within the within the practice um, yeah I mean for us let's say um, in our practice we we, we we are interested in themes and 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 let's say and um, themes and certain topics and let's say for us the workshop and this kind of summer or summer school is like is like one format of of investigating let's say the for example the rule condition or so for us from this it is also going back into our practice so basically we also we, we are doing this workshop also by intention at different locations around Berlin. So also in order to explore different places and from this there can be um, become uh, yeah, uh, kind of another type of project. And at the same time also the, of course, these kind of workshops, they can, let's say, become kind of more like a, like an academy, for example, like a little bit more structure, but, and then maybe it can also 
uh, go back into a, a kind of classic academic ses uh, setting, let's say. Mm. Also, yeah, for, for me, it's also one opportunity of creating a system outside the ac German academic system of education because, yeah, I'm, I currently can't agree to a lot of points in the German academic system of architecture. And yeah, this is also a reason to establish like a little bit parallel. Um, and it does feel that this theme is it, it is recurring in all three of you, but you're sort of almost again at the edge or trying to sort of influence a, a, a different way of thinking. Andrew, probably you more than the others in terms of hit, hitting it straight on with the with the most important uh, age group. Um, I'm going to we're going to close out soon, but I, I think I'd like to just ask really for a little bit of advice really for Galway 2021. Andrew, if you were to take your experience and, 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 and maybe make a couple of suggestions for how Galway should tackle this summer school. Um, what would they be? It would depend on, I, I, I must commence and apologise, but I don't really know what the target for Galway is. And I, I, I think the, the advice I'd give would be different depending on what, if it's for, if it's for secondary school students, so it gives specific let's, let's advice. Let's just say it, it's, it's to engage a, a younger audience. Outreach. So yeah, well, I mean, the the, fir the first one is, I suppose, is uh, less emphasis on output, uh, focus on empathy in terms of the generosity of architecture fundamentally as something comprehensible by anybody. And so that is a kind of fundamental. And then how do you make empathetic links to that through exercises, which are both playful in the sense of skill and open conversations? And I think the conversation is the key one. And then the biggest challenge and the most interesting one is outreach and connection and just how much you will need to canvas schools to just encourage that English teacher or that whoever it is in the school that might put the poster up and who might just make an announcement at the start of a class, if it is that age group you want and to spread the net extremely wide because it's okay that there's only one student in six schools who's interested in architecture and don't necessarily be a salesperson for architecture be receptive to the person who might have the nagging voice but to get that nagging voice and allow it to be expressed will need you to knock on a door a few times and to say it a few times and to make it feel like something that they can do because what we have found is the people who really make the course valuable are the people who are slightly insecure curious as a consequence um and they don't they're never the first applications in the door. And in fact, actually, sometimes they come a day after the deadline. And yeah, so that's that's the hard part. And I don't know how you do it in Ireland, in the UK, we do it using the universities. I'm sure there's systems in Ireland similar to that. Sorry, I've gone on a bit long. No, you haven't at all. It's been fascinating and actually really, really, really great insight. Xenia, could you contribute something to add to that? Uh, yeah, pleasure. Um, I would say, Call it an open classroom, not a summer school. <laughs> and let it be integratable in academic uh, education in schools and universities, it doesn't matter. Um, set no limits, um, can be different programs, but try and uh, go against predetermination <laughs> in age output uh, experience and uh, let it evolve over time um, and uh, surround yourselves with supportive voices. Surround yourself with supportive voices, exactly. It seems like that's it. Again, every, every week it's been the same message really in terms of the, the, the strength of the support team, but also the kind of like-minded voices that need to contribute to this process. Nicholas, to finish with you, could you maybe make a couple of suggestions for Galway? Um, yes, so also what um, uh, for me uh, also became clear now through the other contributors of tonight is that it's also about uh, one thing is like about this kind of shared experience. And um, of course, this shared experience is something which is, which is within the group who is like 
meeting for the first time, let's say, or constituting itself for the first time. And of course, it's like shared experience with others. But uh, then I think also it's this kind of constructing of commons, maybe, or there's a certain, and constructing, uh, um, it's like on two uh, levels, let's say, the constructing is a way of, of it be, that it's getting there, let's say, but it's also constructing means like physically, uh, so mentally and physically constructing. And so uh, I think we, we saw this in the, in the Russian, this kind of art or the structures or this kind of more ephemeral uh, textile uh, sculptures, let's say. Um, but I think it's also, uh, this is, or for us, it was more this pavilion, let's say, or this small structure. And I think this is something interesting if uh, like the whole group or the whole team kind of constructs something together. It doesn't need to be, let's say, a type of architecture. It could also mean a type of event or, but that at the end there's, there's something where everybody had a, like a small part in it. So there is one person who can say, oh, these are my, these vegetables were from uh, my garden. There's the one who kind of smashed it and then uh, the vegetables, another person kind of prepared it. So I think for me, this would be one suggestion to kind of uh, find this one um, bigger vision or this one bigger idea where everybody uh, can relate to, let's say. It's almost the, the collective endeavor, sort of making sure it's a democratized process so that everybody feels like they've they've contributed equally if, even if their their skill sets and their their, their activity has differed uh, really great to speak with all of you nicholas thank you for joining us from berlin Zenia from italy and and andrew from dublin that that concludes conversation four next week we will be returning to galway to have a much more contextual conversation with the relevant people who will support the project next year. It just leads me to thank you all for joining us tonight. Good night. Thank you. What a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all.